Ladies and gentlemen, an American hero, Oz Geist. Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You know, uh, September 11th, 2012 started off as a normal day for us that we're working security in Benghazi. Um, we always worked in the most dangerous places in the world. Otherwise, we didn't need to be there. But all we've heard over the last three, three and a half years since that's happened is what the news media has fed us. And it's about lies and deceit and people covering this up and people covering that up. Um, and what really drew us, myself and the other five members of our team, to write the book, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 13 hours, the true account of what happened in Benghazi was just that. The politicians took a story that was about four Americans who died that night, honoring this country, serving this country, and tried to twist it into a story that shouldn't have been told. Because the only story that should have been told should have been about them and their sacrifice. You know, we have over 300 diplomatic facilities around the world, and there's guys out there doing this every day. There's, there's men and women out there serving our country tonight, so we can have this, what we do here. And these men are exemplified... These men and women are exemplified by the heroic actions of not only the four Americans that died that night, and that was tragic, but also by the other five members of the team that I was a part of, and the positive things that came out of that, which was the integrity, the honesty, and the courage to do what was right, even though it faced in the face of overwhelming odds. That night we got the call from the State Department that their compound had been overrun. The team I worked with was GRS, Global Response Staff. We worked and we were contracted by the Central Intelligence Agency, or I like to call them the Culinary Institute of America. When they, we got the call, we were told to stand down. There's been a lot of controversy over whether that's there or not, but we did get that call and we did get told to stand down and wait. The initial one happened, we figured they were trying to coordinate things with local militias that we had semi-relationships uh, with. But after about 10 minutes, that was, that was enough of that, and the thing to do was to act. We, got, we heard over the radio, the State Department personnel, when they came over the radio and they said, if you don't get here now, we're all gonna die. It was that that caused, that forced us or required us to go help them. Because to me, it's more criminal if you can do something and make a difference in somebody's life and you don't take that opportunity, that's going to be more criminal than anything else. And that's just who we are. As we arrived over at their facility, it was taken over already by about 40 to 50 armed militia members carrying AK-47s, RPGs, and machine guns. Again, which isn't typically what you bring to a protest. With superior tactics, teamwork, and communication, we were able to push those 40, 50 people off that compound and allow the security members from the State Department to come out of their hard points and we started searching for the ambassador and Sean Stevens. It took about two, within those two hours, we were able to recover the body of Sean Stevens. He was, he had passed away from smoke inhalation because of the fires that they had started and those fires wouldn't have been started had we been able to leave earlier and been engaging the enemy instead of allowing them to light matches. But during that time period, we couldn't find the ambassador's body. And we got counter-assaulted by a superior force. We were able to push that force back 
And as we got word, as we let the State Department team go, we got word that there was an even larger force massing outside of the walls. And so the decision had to be made to either stay and fight and continue looking for the body of the ambassador. And we weren't sure if he was even there at that point because we'd been there about two hours. Or to reconsolidate back over at our compound where we knew that we had over 24 Americans that could come under attack at any time. So we made that decision to head back over to the annex. When we arrived back over at the annex, we took up our defensive positions and were ready when we got our first assault. During that first assault, we had about 10, between 20 and 30 guys that came at us. Luckily, because of technology, we had night vision devices. We were able to own the night. Um, they had moved up through the bushes and the trees, and it's depicted very well in the movie. And we just let them get as close as they could. And as they got closer, we, we opened fire on them. And I guess the best way, and it's, in a sense, it's kind of comical, but it was kind of like playing that game at the, uh, at the arcade, whack-a-mole. One of them would stick their head up, somebody would shoot him, he'd go down, his friend would come try to get him, and we just kept taking him out. There was four of us covering that sector where they were coming at us. Took out, in about 15 minutes, they had chose, or they had backed out because they realized that the fight that they had got into now was one that had, was a dog that had a little bit more teeth to it. As they backed out, we kind of regrouped, redistributed our ammunition, made sure everybody was okay, and waited for the next assault that we knew eventually would come. Because in the first one, what they were trying to do is just take out our lights because we had, uh, on the perimeter of our compound. During that time period, we kind of reinforced our positions where we could, and we started seeing them mass again. And as they massed again, they came back at us from the same locations. A guy drove up, and they were trying to breach our back gate with uh, explosives. We were able to take that guy out, and that initiated the next wave of their assault. And this one, they came back at us with about 40 guys. During this time, it lasted 15, 20 minutes. We were able to engage them again, and again, we were able to push that fight back. We had a down, we had kind of a down, uh, down time after that. It was a lull in the fight of about an hour, hour and a half. And it was at this time that a team from Tripoli that had Glenn Doherty in it had arrived to come in and help support us. Their objective was going to be, one, help locate the ambassador's body, which during this lull, we had found out that he had been taken to the uh, local hospital. There had been stories out there that he had been um, mutilated, drugged through the streets, and uh, a lot of bad things done to him. Um, all those were false. Luckily, a neighbor, a Libyan national, was in, had came over to that compound after the fires had burned down, and there was other people there trying to loot the place, and they had found the ambassador's body back in one of the back bedrooms because he got lost in the smoke and the debris. And he was able to recover him and take him from them and, haul, and take him to the hospital, hoping that they could save his life. Unfortunately, he had, been, he had already expired due to the smoke inhalation. The, state, the, the individuals that came from Tripoli had been able to um, commandeer an air, a Libyan aircraft from an individual that they had met the day before. And maybe commandeer's a little bit hard. They talked with him and ended up paying him a large sum of money to use his aircraft. They flew into Benghazi and again got to the airport about 1 o'clock in the morning. By 4.30, about 5 o'clock in the morning, they were able to make their way through bribing another militia to use their vehicles and escort them to our compound. They made it into our compound. During this time, things had kind of quieted down. We were kind of hoping that maybe the fight had come out of them. We could see the sun coming up in the distance, hear the, uh, the minarets and uh, the imams start their morning prayers. And then about 5.30, our guys, the guys from Tripoli that had come down had made it into our compound. Glenn Doherty had came up onto the rooftop where me and Tyrone Woods were. We'd been talking about our families that night. Tyrone shared um, 
a little bit of what happened over at the consulate where he was at. And Tig, one of our other members, had uh, saved his life because Tyrone had gotten lost looking for the ambassador's body, searching through the building. And Ty- Tyrone and Tig had played a little bit of that Marco Polo game and were able to locate each other. And Tig was able to get him out of that smoke before he died. Tyrone was one of the best uh, and strongest warriors I'd ever been with. He had done a full 20, 20 odd years in the, in the Navy SEALs, um, highly respected in our, com- in, in our community. And while we were talking up there, Glenn Doherty had showed up with the guys from Tripoli, come up on the building because he knew that he wanted to meet up with Ty because Ty and him had been friends for years back in the teams. He'd come up and I had never had the pleasure of uh, meeting Glenn before or working with Glenn. Come up and Ty introduced him to me. He said that, uh, hey, this is Glenn. He's a sniper. I said, That's, hopefully we're not going to need you tonight, but I'm afraid that we might. Sun's coming up and we know what happens during that time period. Wasn't about two minutes after that, Glenn had stepped away and was walking back over to the ladder that, where you climbed up onto the, uh, the roof from that we had built. It was out of square, one and a half inch square tubing that we had welded together to make an impromptu ladder so we could fight from the top of the roofs. When the first uh, rocket hit the back gate, or hit the back wall, simultaneously a mortar hit the wall on top, right on top of the wall, which is about 15 feet in front of us. One of the State Department guys that was in the opposite corner of the building started screaming out that he was hit. Kind of glanced over and see the silhouette of him. He had his head in his hands, and he's yelling out that he's hit. When you're working in a small unit like that, you know the first thing is you got to take care of yourself because everybody else has to help secure the situation and put down the enemy before they can come help render medical aid. Knowing that he's, uh, with, him, with him yelling out, we know two things from that. We know that he's breathing, and we know that his heart's beating so he can take care of himself. Me and Ty immediately opened fire on the direction that the rocket came, and they were opening fire on us when the second mortar hit the rooftop. This mortar knocked me back, And as I came back up to re-engage the enemy, I noticed that Ty was in a fetal position at my feet, unresponsive. I brought my left hand up to grab a hold of my rifle, and it was kind of dangling off at about a 90-degree angle. It had gotten hit by shrapnel. As I'm trying to re-engage the enemy, the second mortar that landed up on top of the roof hit me again, and I noticed it also hit Glenn and took Glenn out. And then the third mortar hit, and... The best way I can describe it is it was like getting hit by, getting stung by a thousand bees. I'd gotten hit with shrapnel up and down my body and wasn't sure about how bad it was. But at that point, I kind of figured I better get to some cover because if the fourth one comes, I'm probably not going to make it. Luckily, everything went quiet. For some reason, they quit firing them mortars. And to give you an example of it, it was four mortars landed within a 50 by 30 square foot or a 30-foot by 50-foot square area in a minute and 19 seconds. So we know that they were a pretty highly trained, indiv- trained force that was fighting against us that night. Luckily, Tig, again, with total disregard for his own safety before the debris had even f- quit falling, came up, up on top of the roof, came over, put a tourniquet on Dave Ubin's arm, which was almost severed, and put also a tourniquet on his leg. And then he came over and put a tourniquet on my arm. And I knew that he had to take care of Ty and Glenn because I wasn't sure exactly what their status was. So he helped stand me up, and I walked over to the ladder and then started climbing down. Um, I climbed down while Tig took care of Ty and Glenn. And as you'll see in the movie, we find out that they they didn't make it that night. As Tig's saying a prayer over him, I'm I'm climbing into the front of the, the, the building that we're on top of and directing the the CIA personnel in there how to take care of me. We get my clothes cut off and find out that I got hit in the neck, got hit in the chest, and probably had another 20, 30 holes, uh, superficial wounds up and down my legs and uh, through my eye, under my eyes and into my arms. Um, Took us about two hours to get another militia and get rid of everything that we needed to get rid of that night so we could get out of there. We made our way to the airport, 
and got back on that civilian aircraft that was there that took me, the other wounded, Dave Ubin, and the non-shooting personnel out. The remainder of the people that stayed were all the fighters, all the, all the warriors. They stayed until we could get a, another aircraft in there. Well, the next aircraft that showed up was a C-130. But unfortunately, it wasn't an American C-130. It was a Libyan C-130. We had to kind of, they had to bribe and talk them into getting them out of Benghazi. Finally, 13 hours later, which is where we got from when we first got the call to go rescue the State Department, is when we got our last guy out of Benghazi. I myself was flown straight to the hospital, and my first medical or life-saving treatment was in a Libyan hospital by Libyan doctors. After that, I, was, I made my way to Germany that night, and that was the first American aircraft that we'd seen that got us into Germany. About two days later, there was about 100,000 Libyans that protested the death of Ambassador Stevens. Didn't protest that he died and it was for the bad guys. They protested against the bad guys for killing him because he, he really cared about that country and really tried to do a lot for him. Those same 100,000 Libyans attacked the same people that attacked us. So before we could even muster the courage back home to attack them, we had Libyans who did it for us. They killed a bunch of the, the bad guys and pushed them out of their own town of Benghazi. And after about 14 surgeries, I've got my hand back where it works pretty good. Our team members are back, but unfortunately we lost four Americans. Ty, Glenn, Ambassador Stevens, and Sean Smith. But the important thing out of this is through the courage and the integrity and the honesty of the guys that were there coming together and overcoming those odds, we were able to save more than 24 American lives. And that's really what, why we wrote this book and why the movie was made, so we could show that. Because that's the story that hasn't been told. And that's the story that everybody needs to hear. Forget about the politics and the spin that everybody's putting on it because our politicians and our, mo our, and our media today, they want to keep us on both ends of the spectrum because if we're fighting against each other, the left against the right, we're not paying attention to what they do. From my experience, most of us, no matter what our religious beliefs are, what our political affiliations are, most of us agree on the same thing. We want to live in peace. We want to be able to raise our family. We want our kids to be safe when they walk to school. And we want to be able to earn a living. And if we'd focus more on what our similarities are instead of what our differences are, I think this country could come back and be the greatest country that it is or that it was ever again. And I want to thank Gray, and I want to thank everybody from Cryptech for uh, making that introduction and allowing me to come here and meet all the wonderful people from the Sheep Show and this convention. Because thank you guys, and thank you are what make us want to do the job that we do over there. We're here to help you guys be able to have the lives that we want to have, and you have the lives that you have. And it really makes us proud knowing that we're appreciated, and thank you very much.